at all times. So, Lord, we thank you for uh, just your faithfulness in all times and seasons. And thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for the faithful teaching of Pastor Gary and for these, uh, the students hungry to hear and to receive and to grow. And so, bless this morning with our Bible study time, our worship time, the kids' classes. And just be thankful that you're right here in our midst. We pray and we give thanks to you. Time guide us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Amen. thanks again. Have a great, great All time. right. <laughs> hey, Pastor. Yeah. Hey. Is the vice president's position still open? <laughs> uh, no, that's closed. Writing candidates. Writing candidates. Goodbye, Pastor John. I don't, I don't know what you're referring to. Time's up. You're in duty. Some kind of insider, uh, insider theory. Inside coop. Well, welcome, everybody. I want to just start off and answer Dave's question from two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, you asked, what is the meaning of evangel and apologetics, right? You weren't here last week, so I couldn't answer it. Um, right, we had uptown guests that were on the feet two or three times a year, so. No, that's fine. <laughs> 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 Any excuse work, right? <laughs> That's a good one. All right. So evangel means to tell out, to proclaim. Apologetics doesn't mean it comes from well, you know Greek, right? Because you displayed some of your Greek knowledge. <laughs> it comes from the Greek word ap apologia. Apologia. Now we and we get the word apology from that. It doesn't mean I apologize because I offended you or did something wrong. In a sense, the biblical sense it means the sense to to have a intellectual or a <clears throat> profound sense of defense for the Christian faith, the beliefs of the Christian church. So it's and it's used. It's used, I think, what, 16, 17 times in the New Testament, apologia, and in the sense of defending Christian faith. Well, Robbie, the, Robbie Zachariah was an apologist. I think, was C.S. Lewis considered an apologist also? Uh, I don't know for sure, but yeah. And you go back in the early church history, too. There were those uh, Justin the Martyr and Tertullian and origin in the second century, they were, in a sense, those apologists who put up a defense for the Christian faith. So, and then you have Augustine and yeah, so on, but others that followed that were noted for that. So anyway, that's what it means in the sense of giving proof, giving evidence, putting up a strong uh, defense in terms of the Christian faith. So, Okay? Yeah. All right. I happen to know if that's the same word that Paul uses. Always be ready to give a reason for your faith. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. Okay? But today we're going to look at the second sign, John chapter 4, beginning with verse 46. It's a story of a man who acted in faith and trust. And it was a miracle that was more than just a favor, but also a sign to help people to believe. Some of you may have heard this story from me before. <clears throat> One of my trips to Tanzania, my mission trips to Tanzania, <clears throat> one day we were doing some renovation on the nursing school. There was 
some leakage, and so we had to do some repairs. And <clears throat> mid-morning, I stopped by just to check to see how things were going, if there was any needs. And they said, yeah, we need some four-inch nails. So I said, okay, I'll go down the village and get those. So I borrowed somebody's bike and started pedaling down, which was a little over half a mile to the village, and picked up the nails. And on my way back, um, I s wanted to stop in at another project that we were doing, another building that was adjacent to the hospital where we were renovating this huge house uh, to make it into a boys' dormitory for the nursing school. So I went in just to see how they were doing, but, and it had a large walled-in courtyard, and as I went in, off to the right, there was this small room, and Andrew was in there helping another person. Andrew was, <clears throat> had leprosy, missing some fingers and toes, but he was healed. And it was kind of his ministry to take care of other fellow lepers in the village. And he was really faithful in doing that. And just So I went into this little room <clears throat> and there was an older man sitting there, kind of a small, frail man, sitting in a chair. Andrew was kneeling down in front of him and this man, he had leprosy, and <clears throat> he had his feet in this shallow pan of water. Well, this old man didn't have any shoes. He couldn't wear any shoes. He was walking around barefoot, bandaged, and so on. But Andrew was kind of had like a big tweezers pulling off all of this dead flesh and raw. And... Um, this man had his feet in this water. It was dirty because he had just walked in off the, the road, in a sense. And I said, Andrew, why don't you have some clean water for this guy? He said, well, you know the well is down, so we're short of water, and et cetera, so okay. But this man, his feet, I looked at it, and I was just, whoa. Raw flesh oozing with pus blood, and you could even see parts of the bones in his toes. It's just eating away both of his feet, his toes. And, uh, and of course, he didn't feel anything because uh, my understanding is that leprosy does kill the nerve endings. And so it was, yeah, it was quite the sight. I took some pictures of it, but so my heart really went out to this guy. And he didn't understand English, and I really didn't understand Swahili. So I took the name, took authority in the name of Jesus, I laid my hands on him, and I prayed for him that he would be healed. Then I left, went, took the nails back to the guys, and about a week later, we were down at this community center that we had built for the lepers. And uh, there were three of us standing there talking. And this man, this older man who was being treated by Andrew, came up and stood there just kind of listening in. And I recognized him. And I looked down then at his feet. He was barefoot. And the new skin completely over all of his toes. walking around as if there was no infection, no leprosy, anything. So I believe miracles do happen. You know, it, that the Lord can use us to reach out and make a difference and help people to believe this. Jesus has the power to heal. You know. What a mighty God we serve. Pardon? Yes, 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 yeah. All right, today, chapter 4, verse 46, another miracle of healing had happened. <clears throat> Once more he visited Cana and Galilee, Jesus, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. 
When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and to heal his son, who was close to death. Well, Jesus, after the wedding in Cana, went down to Jerusalem and then went through Samaria. And eventually he met the woman at the well as he was returning back to Cana. <clears throat> and so then now we have this story where this royal official from Capernaum sought out Jesus because his son was very sick. The official was on the payroll of King Herod of Antipas and heard that Jesus had come to Canaan. What did he hear? Was it a rumor? Was it a story? Had somebody been healed that he had talked to? How is it he knew that he could find help with, in Jesus? Was it some sort of come to Jesus moment for this man? Was the Holy Spirit working in his heart, his mind, and say, you need to go see Jesus? Evidently, he was not a believer, it seemed, as we find out later in the story about that. And what did he want that Jesus could do? He wanted a miracle. He wanted a healing for his son. Yeah, right. Now the official had to walk from Capernaum to Canaan, which was about 20 miles. <laughs> was that a good day's walk or a day and a half or? Yeah, but I think, what does that show? The fact that he was willing to walk 20 miles to find this Jesus. Desperation. Faith. Faith, Desperation. Yeah. Hope. yeah, yeah, hope, yeah. He believed that Jesus could heal his son. Pardon? He believed that Jesus could heal his son, that's why he went. Could be, yeah, yeah. It doesn't say that right, you know, in the text, but we can assume that there must have been that hope, that belief that, yeah. I would think that he had heard of many miracles that Jesus performed. Yeah, could have been, yeah, yeah. But Jesus had actually come to the place. Yeah, He's yeah. come back with him to the church. Yeah, yes, right, yeah. <laughs> So he begged Jesus to go back to Capernaum with him and to heal his son. And then what Jesus say in verse 48, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. <laughs> yeah. So does it take miracles for us to believe? Only miracles? <laughs> yeah, we like the proof, we like the evidence. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus. Excuse me, where is the passage that we might uh, have this exact right? Blessed are those who see and believe, how much more blessed are those who do not, do not see and believe. believe. Yeah. Yep, I can't recall that scripture right offhand. Yeah, right. So Jesus states that the miracle seemed to be the only way that people will believe in him. But the miracles, as we said before, too, are also given to us, are given to the people of the time, too, so that they will believe, that can confirm their faith in him, their belief in him that he is the one, the son of God, the one from God. So, <clears throat> so verse 49, the royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. <clears throat> There'd be a sense of urgency there maybe in that, huh? It's close to death, his son is close to death. I need you to come down. I need you to come with me to Capernaum. Why do you think he had this passionate, persistent plea? 
a seriousness in his tone. Why did he think he thought Jesus needed to be present to do the miracle? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he heard rumors or heard stories where Jesus touched people and they were healed. Yeah. Touched a lot of people. Yeah. And feelings just flowed from that. And this fellow may have simply assumed mm -hmm. that a touch was required. Yeah. Could have been. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's that Roman. Pardon? Then there's that Roman. <laughs> Also, yeah, the right. Touched his clothes. Yeah. 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 He said it's your face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a cultural expectation that if you were to ask to lay hands on somebody. Yeah, could have been. What? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Mary, why did you lay your hands on that leper? Same reason? Yeah, I suppose the touch. Yeah. Yeah. It's most traditional from the Old Testament and the New Testament to lay hands. Yeah, it was. Life. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that John records, yeah. Here's my question. Why would that be established with the healing other people if he said he didn't want to touch them? Well, John doesn't record all of the miracles that happen. He just, he just says, this is a second miracle that I'm writing about. Yeah. He's going to just explain it. Yeah. But if you go back to synoptics, yeah, there's other miracles of healing, raising the dead, and so on, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So the fact that he's, this official said, well, Jesus, you have to come to Capernaum to heal my son. Do you think this, his belief at this point was kind of short-sighted? Like you said, Susan, maybe not really understanding who Jesus was and what he could do in the fullest sense of the word. Was there still a bit of a lack of trust, maybe? Did he really understand who Jesus was or only went by the rumors or hearsay from other people? Yeah. He may have only known that Jesus healed people. Yeah. That may have been the only thing that he heard. Yeah. Well, I can well imagine when, you know, this these kind of things were happening, word spread pretty fast. <laughs> you know, here's somebody that seems to be unusual that can heal people. And... It wouldn't have been, come see the prophet. Yeah. Or come be healed by this guy. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then in verse 50, Jesus replied, you may go, your son will live. You may go, your son will live. It seems to be the plight is fairly curt, straightforward, short. And he doesn't go to the house to heal this son. Why do you think Jesus <clears throat> responded in this way? Why do you think he just said, decided not to go to the house, <clears throat> the man's house, and heal his son? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The fact that he would come seek Jesus out, that there was some, seemed to be some belief in this man that Jesus could do something to heal his son. And it, to me, it's like Jesus kind of build on that faith now. All right, you believe, just go. Your son will be well. Yeah. There have also been other people Jesus healed. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and as Connie said, yeah. since the fellow had the faith, yeah. he didn't need to go and 
executing with whatever he was doing in Canaan at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that's right. He responded to the man's faith, yeah. basically, and said, yes, you saw that. And so the official's response then to what Jesus said, what did he do? Did he hesitate? Did he doubt? Did he question? Yeah. Yeah. Took Jesus at his word. He trusted. And he left. He departed. Yeah, he believed, he trusted, and he obeyed. Again, it's a demonstration, I think, of his faith, his belief in Je it's Jesus. Right. Why, why did Jesus take him to the land of signs and wonders you will not believe? Hmm. Was he saying that for the crowd that was with him? Or was he... Could have been, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. All right. Then verse 51. While he was still on his way, the servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Seventh hour is about one o'clock in the afternoon. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus has said to him, your son will live. So he and his household, what? Believed. <laughs> yeah. And this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. <clears throat> Now we can probably speculate when Jesus said, go, your son will be healed. But in a sense that the man was eager to get home, to walk that 20 miles pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> but while on his way home, his servants met him to tell him the good news, your son is healed, he is living. Yeah. And to find out that he was healed that day before day before seems to indicate that he was not in a hurry to get home. Day before, see? So evidently, he, I believe that, yeah, okay, my son's okay. But then his servants met him part way and said, the next day and said, hey, he's alive, he's well. Good news. Yeah. And then the result was of that, so he and his household believed. So again, I think it's a sense that there was this growing, a deeper faith and belief in who Jesus was and what he could do. <clears throat> so that sign was a divine process, stretching, you might say, the official's faith, right? Verse 46 to 47, there was a beginning of his faith, you might say, that seed faith that was there in that official. 48, 49, we find that there was this persistent faith. He urged, he asked Jesus, right? And then verse 50, trusting that obedient faith, put his faith into action. And then 53, 54, found out that his son had healed. It was a confirming of his trust, his belief. So we see that process then, how the official came to a stronger faith and what Jesus could do and did do for him and his son. So we learn from that that faith is a gift. Scripture says that in Ephesians, that it's a gift from God in one sense. But it's a gift that grows as we use it. As we use it. Faith is trusting Jesus for who he is, not so much for what he can do, but for who he is, he takes him at his word. And so faith and obedience, are they necessary to receive Jesus' help? 
Yes? No? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does, just like this official. He believed, he obeyed, he went. Yeah. So what do we learn, some spiritual lessons from this sign of this miracle of Jesus? Maybe Jesus was testing this official to a certain degree, huh? To see, if he really believed. Would he go or would he stand there and argue and say, <laughs> you know, no, Jesus, no, you need to be there and I need you to go right away or no, yeah. So sometimes I think Jesus may test us to see if we to measure our faith. You think that's true? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what happened then to this official son was not just the healing of his that son, but we see that out of that came that development, that growth, that increase of faith in the heart of the official and his household. So there are those results. How would you define trust? What words would you use? How would you define trust? Depending on someone without knowing what they're going to do. Say it. Depending on someone without knowing what they're going to do. Okay. Dependence. Okay, in a sense, yeah. Having confidence that someone will do what they say they're going to do. Yes. Belief. Belief? Okay. Peace rather than being anxious with people or yeah, probably is one of the results of trust, peace, more so, I would think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of you people are hikers. Some aren't, but my age, when I go backpacking, I have trekking poles <laughs> just to help my balance and if I'm crossing streams or rocky areas or whatever, but, and it helps me to, I can lean on those trekking poles to, using my arms, not just my legs, to go uphill too, right? I think trust is something like that, that we, it's a leaning on on Jesus, a leaning support. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a confidence, that bold confidence. You might say that trust is the root that upholds and nourishes the tree of the Christian life. Sometimes we use faith and trust interchangeably. That's true. Faith is, like I said, is a gift from God. That's one sense of it. But um, faith is also, you might say, an active trust in God in the sense of believing in God and believing what God has done. But faith also, part of faith is, it means there's a commitment, a commitment to, to Jesus. And we see that in the story of the official. So, so yeah, it's a confidence and there's a reliance. I and see. I don't know if I spelled that right, but a, a reliance on, on Jesus. Okay, an assurance there that he is who he is and can do what he can do. Proverbs three five. Some of you may know that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. All your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So again, trust is a word that is used 
close to 200 times in scripture. And so I would like to break it down a little bit more. Trust. What do we mean? When it comes to trust, we need to take an inventory. Where are we at? Where am I at in my faith, my belief in Jesus, right? There's a story, this wise school teacher who sent a note home to the parents of her children and said, if you promise not to believe everything your child says that goes on in school, I promise I won't tell you everything what the child tells me what goes on your home. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's, we, we have to take inventory of what we trust what we believe in yeah and do we trust Jesus with just the big things in our lives we make major decisions or important issues or concerns yeah I hope so what about the little things in life? How we spend our money, painting our house, grocery shopping, doing laundry, planning our day, do we trust him to guide us and to lead us through those kinds of decisions or not? Believe and trust. You, when you read your Bible, do you believe it? Do you obey it? <laughs> okay, yeah. Do you need miracles for your faith, for your belief? Psalm 37, verses 3 and 6. Psalm 37, verses 3 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, for he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. So again, just as words of encouragement to trust. And trust everything to the control and the guidance of the Lord. And then, the hard part, wait patiently <laughs> for him to work out what is best for us. Yeah. Okay. Part of trust is also that reverence, huh? That respect. We see that in the official son. He had that sense of reverence. Here was an official who was a man of authority, but yet when he came to Jesus, right? He was under Jesus' authority in a sense. He was willing. So there was that reverence, that, res that respect. And, and because of that, I think in the end, he even had a stronger reverence for who Jesus was because the healing of his son. And the reverence then recognizes that Jesus as a needed presence in our lives. He is that source of love, forgiveness, blessings, healing for our sinful nature. And so we come to him with that sense of reverence. And then part of trust is It takes some understanding, right? For us to grow on that trust. Understanding what God is saying to us and what he wants us to do. That's important. The official's faith was open, receptive to who Jesus was and what he could do. He listened, he obeyed. 
and his trust became stronger because of it. So it's necessary for us, if we want to grow in our own understanding and knowledge of, for God, we need to be open and to seek, to explore. Another part of trust is to surrender, is to surrender. Again, we see that in the official. In a sense, he surrendered to the authority of Jesus. And in the shadow of his son's possible death, he trusted Jesus. He surrendered to his mercy, to the healing power that was there for his son. So by surrendering to Jesus, there can be a release, a release from our doubts, from our fears, our anxieties, and give us even all the more confidence than to trust in this Jesus. <clears throat> and surrender allows God to fulfill our needs all the more. It opens the door, in a sense, for him to meet our needs. And through that, then, that helps our belief to, to grow and to deepen. And the third thing is now, it doesn't say it in our story, but do you think the official in his household were thankful? For the healing? Certainly, I would think so. Yeah. So, yes, thankfulness is really important in our sense of trust. Because when we thank the Lord, we recognize who he is, what he's done. And it shows our appreciation. Yeah. <clears throat> Philippians 4, 6. What does that say? Some of you, I think, know that by heart, huh? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Yeah. And again, in Psalm 118 is another example. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. So we can and we should be thankful even for the smallest things that life, that God blesses us with. Thankful for the gift of life in each day and for the Lord's promise to be present, to walk with us. Thankful that no matter what happens in our lives, that God will not take his love away from us. That unconditional love and grace that he has for us. So the question is, would your faith be stronger if you could experience a miracle in your life? Probably, huh? Yeah, yeah. Miracles kind of come with an acute need. There's an acute need and then a miracle. Yeah, yeah. Miracles are subjective things too. I mean, so like in the, during the day, they have things called minor miracles. They're okay. not big things, but like this morning I was taking the dog out and I slipped on black ice. Like I was giving thanks right at that moment that I didn't fall and crack my head and didn't want to shoot. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, at this age, the slip on black ice could. Yeah. So I was very thankful. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I seriously could have been, I think it was a miracle. It's a reason for me not to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it is subjective. It's just, it's not a need. These things just kind of take place. Yeah, they can. They do. Yeah. Yeah. I could say that waking up every morning is a miracle. That's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've, I've said this before. We wake up in the mornings. There's two things we can say. Good God, it's morning. <laughs> or thank God, you know, it's morning. 
and that can set the tone for the day sometimes. Well, that's what, yeah. You know. God's good either way. Pardon? God is good either way. Yeah. Yeah. This is also something in trust that you have to realize that God doesn't need you to do it. Uh, his requirement is mm-hmm. you're asking him to do it. Mm-hmm. It's something that's not up to you. Sure, sure. But you trust that he will do it. Why does he do it? Because he, because he loves us, yeah. Because he loves us, yeah. He cares about us, yeah. And I think, in a sense, there are those little miracles that happen in life that we are sometimes unaware of. Yeah. So, yeah. Somebody out on con where somebody said something about peace and peace. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Quick stories like I used to not like road rage, but I'd get my blood pressure up and mm-hmm. pissed off once sure. a week, even with some guy that trusts my honesty. But now, and I don't know if it's because I'm getting old, I can't take big guys down anymore. But, <laughs> uh, somebody cuts me off, I just, I just don't even think about it, and I don't let that affect me. And I, am I thankful? Yeah, I'm really thankful. I'm absolutely. And I think part of it is minor miracle. That, that's a big miracle to me to have my Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I used to have the same reaction when I was younger. You know, that, what kind of a crazy driver are you? And, but the Lord has said, Gary, <laughs> there's a better way to deal with this. I pray for them. Maybe they're in a hurry for a reason. Yeah. You know, and you know, pray for their safety. Just, yeah. You know, so that you makes that that changes my whole attitude towards. You think that way, though. I mean, I don't know if it's eighty percent of the time, but there are some people that drive recklessly. Oh, sure. Because they are in the emergency situation. So just think like that, and it's okay. It's cool. It's yeah, cool. we don't know the situation, their circumstances, or. Yeah, whether they're angry or they're drunk, or they're chasing somebody, or are they trying to get somebody to the hospital, or who knows? So, so give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. You know, don't sweat the details. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Along that same line, a lot of us have a habit of if it's stoplight catches us, traffic cones mm-hmm. us, we get angry. But lately, I've tried to think maybe God is using that to stop me before I get into a bad situation holding back oh, yeah. on purpose. Yeah. Working for my good yeah. rather than against me. There's been times in my life I said, whoa, what if I had been, you know, two minutes later or whatever. And exactly. so again, I think, you know, we sometimes we're just unaware how the Lord is really looking out for us and protecting us and you know i think back to trust uh, what helps us to gain trust and faith is when we pray and we have an answer to prayer yeah that sure helps me from the next time i did that so it is true yeah yeah reading scripture thinking and meditating on it listening to the lord Right, obeying what we're told to do. Yes. And when we have those kinds of experiences where we see the hand of the Lord working in our lives to be thankful. And those kind of things that build that trust in us. Yeah. And trust is a process. It's not just, you might say, a a possession that we have. <laughs> it's more than that. It's a growing process as we go through life. Yeah. And we saw that in the official, right? <laughs> you might say he had that seed faith, he heard about Jesus, but in the end, <laughs> it was a very confirming faith that he ended up with. So there was a growth process. And so, yeah, it's, it's a process as we grow in trust and belief in, in God. Gary? Yeah. <clears throat> I have tons of faith and confidence that 
my eye will get healed, but I might have to wait till Mark down right. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, thank you for being here this morning. Next week, the third sign. So.